This is going to be the next lesson for the Bible Institute. And last time we looked at Adam and Eve in the garden, perfect. They had the perfect marriage, perfect everything. There was nothing going on bad at all. Perfect weather. No, nothing they could complain about. But now we're going to look at the days of Adam when he fell. Before we seen the dispensation of innocence we've seen the Edenic covenant and here's a quick review of what we learned for the dispensation of innocence and the Edenic covenant the main characters were obviously God Adam and Eve and uh, the responsibilities don't eat off the tree keep the garden be fruitful and multiply that was the responsibility. Not much of one. He wasn't having to sweat for food or anything. And the symbol or token for that uh, covenant was the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. Now there was a test. And the test was, would they eat from the forbidden tree? Genesis two fifteen through 17. That was the test. And you know, if they passed the test, they would have been righteous and probably would have ate off the tree of life and lived forever in a righteous state. So the, the agreement, the agreement was remain in paradise without working, sweating, pain, sickness, sorrow, or any death as long as they didn't eat off of that tree. That was the agreement. That was that Edenic covenant. But you seen the failure. They ate from the tree. Genesis 3, 6. The judgment was Adam lost his job. Job, <clears throat> He was driven from the garden. He faced a spiritual death and an inevitable physical death that would come later. See Genesis 3, 23 through 24. That's the judgment that we're going to see is going to come upon them. That, and that will close out this, the dispensation of innocence. So, we are about to cross over from the time of innocence to a time of conscience. So, Adam and Eve had no knowledge of good and evil, and now they will be faced with a test. They can resist the devil and partake of the tree of life after passing the test and overcoming that temptation that the serpent's going to lay on them, or they can give in to the serpent and, and partake of the per forbidden fruit. So Genesis 3, we're going to see Adam and Eve when they fall. We had seen they were perfect in innocence before. They hadn't been faced with the test. Now they're going to be faced with the test. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye should not eat of every tree of the garden? So what you have here is the serpent, which is the devil and Satan, formerly Lucifer, approaching the bride while the husband is not around. And this is a picture of the devil trying to beguile the bride of Christ before Jesus Christ comes back in the rapture. Now me and you were part of the bride of Christ. Uh, the bride of Christ is all born again believers. We make up the body of Christ. It's also called the bride of Christ. And... While the Lord Jesus Christ isn't here in the flesh, He lives inside of us, obviously. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But, since he, while He's not here in the flesh, what you have is the devil attacking us, trying to make us trip up before Jesus Christ comes back to get us in the rapture. He comes at a time when the man... Jesus Christ isn't phys physically present with the bride, just like he approached Eve when Adam wasn't physically there with her. And Paul makes the same comparison to the carnal Corinthian church. He, he gives them the same comparison. In 2 Corinthians eleven two through 3, he says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, 
So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, the devil is trying to pull us the other way, whether it be in our living or in our doctrine, whatever. He's trying to deceive you and make you as worldly as possible before Jesus comes to get you in the rapture. Just like he was trying to deceive the woman, he went after Eve, the weaker vessel, before Adam came back. Genesis 3, 2 and 3. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Notice that Eve actually doesn't have the word of God hidden in her heart good enough. I'm sure Adam gave her the same command that was given him by the Lord, but Eve messes it all up. Here is what the Lord actually said in regards to the tree in Genesis 2, 16 through 17. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. You see, the Lord didn't say anything about touching it. Eve did. So Eve added to the word. He didn't say, lest ye die, either. He said, thou shalt surely die. You know, that was severe, a lot more severe than Eve had it in her mind. So she subtracted from the word, word and changed it. Paul also warns the Corinthians, that same carnal Corinthian church, about corrupting the word of God in 2 Corinthians 2.17. Notice how the devil got Eve to question the word of God and she changed the words all on her own. Then the devil does the same. In Genesis 3, 4, it says, And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Notice that the devil goes completely contrary to the word of God. He said that they wouldn't die. The devil is a liar. He's a liar and the father of it. He goes on to say in verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see, he always mixes in a bit of truth with his lies. And this makes people see the bait, and they don't see the hook. Notice that he seems to know exactly who the gods, little g, are. They're the ones that her and Adam were supposed to replace. But he easily deceived Eve through his subtle lies. And verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Eve fell for the same sin as Lucifer, that is the sin of pride. She wanted that higher knowledge. She wanted the knowledge that she would have gotten from eating off that forbidden tree. She had the lust of the flesh. She had the lust of the eyes and the pride of life all presented to her right there. And this event in the garden seems to be the reason why a woman isn't supposed to have authority over a man or to teach a man. And that's why it says in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So she saw that the tree, she saw that the fruit was pleasant to the eyes. Looks are deceiving. And remember that God made all the trees in the garden to be pleasant to the sight, not just that one. You see, this tree was forbidden, so it had that extra draw to it. Just like sometimes you see things that are forbidden, and it has that little bit of extra temptation to it. Also, mix in the fact that the eyes of man are never satisfied, as the Bible says. And the devil will work with that. Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So, the dispensation of innocence has come to an end. They're no longer innocent. Now they got the knowledge of good and evil. They failed the test. The Edenic covenant has come to an end. The time ends in failure on man's part. They're no longer innocent. They failed the test. They didn't hold up their end of the covenant. 
The agreement was for them to dress and keep the garden, be fruitful, multiply, eat anything they wanted to eat in there, except for the fruit of the forbidden tree. They broke the covenant. They, they failed the test. They're no longer innocent. And they sold, they sold fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, fig leaves are going to picture self-righteousness. And this picture is a man who finds out he's a sinner. And instead of coming to God to get things fixed and to get righteousness from God, he tries to cover up his sin with something else, his own righteousness. And your righteousness will never be good enough to cover your unrighteousness or to get rid of it. Just as a child gets to a point where he is ashamed of his nakedness, now Adam and Eve are ashamed of their nakedness. You see, before they fell, it may be that their, their nakedness was covered with light, just as God is clothed with light as his garment. As it talks about in Psalm 104, 2, where it says, Who covereth, coverest thyself with light as with the garment? Maybe it was like that for Adam and Eve. Maybe they fell, they lost that light. And in Genesis 3, 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now this is the angel of the Lord come down, a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word, the voice of God walking in the garden. And Adam and Eve hide themselves. They knew that they were in sin. And when something completely pure shows up, it would scare you to death. The Lord is perfectly pure. And in, in that presence of something so pure, you're ashamed and it just makes you want to hide. They hid under the trees, most likely because, just like the Bible says in Hosea 4.13, 4, the shadow thereof is good. And because men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil, they, they go to hide. In Genesis 3.9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He knows exactly where he is. He's asking for the sake of Adam because he's going to teach him something. He's not asking for the sake of himself. Obviously, God knows where we're all at. In Genesis 3, 10 through 11, and he said, I heard the voice. This is Adam talking. And he said, I heard the voice of the in the garden. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee? that thou was naked. Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? He did. He broke the agreement. He broke the covenant. He's no longer innocent. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. You see, men tend to blame God and blame somebody else for the bad things that they do. But really, we're responsible for the bad things that we do. When I sin... It's my fault. I chose to do it. And yeah, I'm a sinner. I've got a sin nature. Most likely, I'm not going to stop sinning until the rapture. You know, I'm not going to stop sinning. But think about it. Each sin that you do, you did it of your own free will. God didn't make you do it. Somebody else didn't make you do it. You did it of your own free will. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Eve blames the serpent. And this is where you get the phrase, The devil made me do it. Adam blamed God, and he blamed Eve. He looks at Eve. Eve blames the serpent. You know, she says, The devil made me do it, basically. But you're going to see even... Other times in the Bible when the devil is bound, man still is messing up. So it ain't just the devil making us do it. In Genesis 3, 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Remember that man is made from the dust. From dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And what's the devil feeding on? Dust. And he walketh about seeking whom he may devour as a roaring lion. Now Genesis 3.15, he says this, the Lord says this to the serpent. He says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
This is the first direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus in the scriptures. Not the first time you see him altogether, because we done seen him as the voice of the Lord God walking. We done seen him in picture and types, but the first direct prophecy of him is right here. And the seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the promised seed. And the seed of the serpent is the Antichrist, and he's going to get his head bruised. So throughout the Bible, you see the devil's men getting head wounds. The devil's going to have his head wounded. And Genesis 3.16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. What you're reading now has to do with the Adamic covenant. So, we, we had been looking at the Edenic Covenant. We had been looking at the Dispensation of Innocence. Now, we're moving into the Adamic Covenant. You see, before you could say the way man stayed right with God was by bypassing the tree. What did they have to do under, in that uh, Dispensation of Innocence, under that Edenic Covenant? They bypassed that tree. As long as they would have done that, they'd have been okay. They didn't do that. Now, they're going to have to bring a sacrifice. Now, in this uh, covenant, the main characters are Adam, Eve, and Adam's sons. And the covenant is the Adamic covenant. And some things that go along with this covenant is the woman must now have painful childbirth. Her desire will be to her husband and he shall rule over her. Adam would now have to work hard for food by the sweat of his face. Man would now have to bring a bloody animal sacrifice, and man will physically die. Much of this covenant is still in effect today, and goes all the way up through the millennial reign. So you just can't cut, it up, cut the Bible up in these covenants, because a lot of them have stuff in them that overlap throughout the Bible. Now, the purpose of this covenant is to deal with the results of the fall of man. You know, what is God going to do with man now that he's sinned and got the knowledge of good and evil? And the token of this covenant is the coats of skins that's good, that God is going to make for Adam and Eve to clothe them with. That's the token of this covenant. Just like the last one, the token of the covenant was the Garden, Eden, Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life. Now it's these coats of skins. So what's the dispensation that goes along with this covenant. This covenant brings in what many people call the dispensation of conscience. And that they've, they've named it that because, for a good reason, because when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, it gave them awareness of what was good and evil. Also, there was no written law for man to go by yet. During this dispensation, the Lord gives man the opportunity to keep himself pure through his conscience. You see, there was no written law to live by, but the Lord had things written in their heart. Just like it talks about in Romans 2, 14 through 15. He writes it in their heart. But, it doesn't end well. But the agreement is, do what they know to be right, and bring a sacrifice to the Lord. That's the agreement. The length of time that uh, this dispensation runs... It runs from the fall of man, right there in Genesis 3, around until Noah gets off the ark. Around, it's around 1,700 years, the length of time for this dispensation. And you read about this dispensation and this covenant mainly in Genesis 3.15 through Genesis 8. And the failure is, what's the failure for this Dispensation here is that man can't stay right with God. Their conscience gets seared. Every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually, as it says in Genesis 6, 5. In Genesis 6, 2 through 6, man ends up mixing with the sons of God and corrupting the seed on the earth. That was the failure. He was going to let them um, keep themselves pure through their conscience. Man does what's right in his own eyes. They end up with every imagination of the thought of their heart being only evil continually. 
Now what's the judgment? The judgment is a worldwide flood destroys every breathing thing other than Noah and his family. Just like the judgment that was at the end of the last dispensation, dispensation of innocence, Adam kicked out of the garden. Spiritual death he has to face. Physical death he has to face. Now, I, this one has a judgment at the end of it. A worldwide flood would destroy every breathing thing other than Noah and his family. What's the Lord Jesus seen as in this one? Well, in this one, Abel's bloody sacrifice. That's where you see the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And you see him in Adam's thorns and thistles. He became a curse for us and wore a crown of thorns. Okay, that's the intro to the Adamic covenant and the dispensation of conscience. Now, Genesis 3.17, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Since Adam broke the covenant... He can't just eat freely without hard labor. Now he has to do hard labor for his food. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So you need to be working for your food. Second Thessalonians 3.12 says, Now them that are such we command and exhort by Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Now the reason me and you are working today is because of what Adam did. In Ephesians 4.28 it says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. needeth. So Adam started this working thing. He's the first worker. Hard work, hard labor. And in Genesis 3.18, it says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. This is part of the curse that came on the world because of what Adam did. Thorns and thistles. He's going to have to deal with this stuff. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. The ground is cursed. Now it has thorns and thistles, and this puts you in mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because Jesus Christ be became the, the curse for us on the cross. It says in Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And what did Jesus Christ wear when he hung on the tree? A crown of thorns. You see, the first Adam brought sin's curse on the planet. He brought in those thorns and thistles. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became the curse and died for it, wearing that crown of thorns so that he could get rid of the curse. You see, you see Jesus in everything. Before you got saved, you were a part of the Adam's family, the one that brought the curse into the world. Now that you're saved, you're adopted into the last Adam's family. Jesus is the last Adam. The first Adam brought sin into the world. The last Adam is a, quick, a quickening spirit. The fall brought a curse in the ground. And Adam is going to have to deal with getting pricked by the thorns and thistles. He's going to get cut up and hurt while he's working. You know, I'm sure you've had jobs. I've had jobs where my hands were cut all to pieces at the end of the day. I'd get splinters in my hands and my feet. I've had jobs where my hands get dried up and calloused and are white and dried up and cracking and bleeding just from it being all dried up. I've had jobs where my fingers get smashed and I've had fingernails get tore off. It's all because of the curse. We had to work with our hands and your legs hurt and your feet hurt and your back hurts and your eyes are heavy and tired. And you got to work in the heat. You got to work in extreme cold. You got to work all these long hours. It's all because of the curse. I've had jobs where it was so hot you started sweating before you started working. I've got a job now where it's so cold it makes, it'll make your fingers throb. And the sweat and snot.
and the, the sweat is not a freeze to your head. It's all because of the curse. Uh, job, they're hard. It's hard working, hard labor. Some jobs may be easier, but then on the jobs that are easier, you're not sweating as much and you're not getting as physical, so they're not as good on your health. See, you got to sweat to get the junk out of you that's going in you. In Genesis 3.19 it says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Part of the curse is that we sweat. Part of the Adamic covenant is that he will sweat for food. And that still lives on today. You'll sweat for your food, or the food you eat will just lead to an early death because you don't sweat out the toxins. And in Genesis 3.20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Uh, many people point out that God didn't name Eve. Adam did. Before he was just calling her M Miss Adam. In Genesis 5.2 it says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So God sees you and your wife as one, one flesh. He called their name Adam. But now here is what goes along with this covenant. The blood of an animal had to be shed. In Genesis 3.21, it says, And unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. The Lord had to sacrifice an animal, and he clothed the nakedness of Adam and Eve. This sets up the pattern for them having to bring a bloody animal sacrifice. And that coats of skins, like I said, that was the symbol or token for this covenant. You know, they would do what they knew to be right, and they would offer a bloody animal sacrifice, as you're going to see in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel. And in Genesis 3.22, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. You see that? You see, if Adam ate from the tree, being a sinner now, in his sinful state, he would have lived forever in that sinful state. But God had it fixed, you see, to where whatever ate from that tree would, would live forever. And he himself wouldn't even reverse it himself. That's the way he had it fixed. That's the way he had it set up. To where if Adam went in there and got, ate, all, ate the fruit of that tree of life, even in his sinful state, if he ate it, he would have lived forever in his sinful state. That's the way God had it set up. He had it fixed to where if you ate from it, he himself wouldn't even reverse it. See, just like you, think about your situation. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, hung on the tree for you and you partook of what hung on the tree, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you got eternal life that way. The same way Adam would have got eternal life if he ate off the right tree, you got eternal life because you partook of what hung on the tree, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same good thing, it's the same way for you. God himself made it to where whoever partook of the Son of God who hung on the tree could never lose eternal life no matter what. So no matter what you've done, maybe you've done some horrible things since you were saved, no matter what you've done, it can't make you lose eternal life. He had it fixed to where whoever partook off of that tree, you two partook of the Son of God, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't get unsaved. you got eternal life no matter what. So since Adam is now a sinner... The Lord has to make sure he doesn't eat off of that tree. And if he would have passed the temptation in the garden and, and passed the test, he, he, he could have took of the tree of life. Most likely, Adam and Eve would have eaten of the tree of life had they passed the test and not gave in to the serpent. But they failed the test. Eve gave in and did what the serpent said. Adam gave in and did it because he loved Eve. So they failed the test. And it says in Genesis 3.23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. That's part of that. Um, part of that 
judgment from the first covenant is is that Adam lost his job. What was one of his responsibilities was to dress and keep the garden. Now he's kicked out. And Adam lost his job in the garden. Eden. Now he must do hard labor for food. Genesis 3.24 So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You're going to see that in most dispensations and scenes in the Bible, there is outward evidence that there is another world out there beyond this physical one that we see with our eyes. Adam obviously knew the Lord and wasn't operating so much by faith all this time before when he was innocent and even after that he's not innocent. He's mostly operating by sight. I mean, he heard the actual voice of God. We don't hear God voice in our ears we he talks through us to us through the word and we accept it by faith adam was hearing it in his ears i mean he saw the angel of the lord he saw lucifer he saw cherubs he saw a flaming sword which turned every way in the dispensation that me and you are in today we're operating by faith not by sight we can't see god we can't hear his voice, but we have a book with words. We open it, we read it, we place our faith in it. For the most part, our dispensation is the weird one because it's the one where people operate by faith and all the other ones you see through the Bible, people are seeing stuff. Seeing stuff, they're operating more by sight. Even in the tribulation, in the millennium, in the millennium, they're going to literally see Jesus Christ on the throne. In the tribulation, they're going to see all this supernatural plagues happening. During Jesus' earthly ministry, what did you see? What did they see? They saw miracles. They saw Jesus Christ walking and talking. They saw him walk on water. They saw him do all these miracles. In Adam's case, he's seeing cherubs. During the law, Moses had all this supernatural stuff going on. Uh, they, were, they, they went by a pillar of a, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. They saw the Red Sea. Uh, part all these things so if anything our dispensation is the weird one where we're operating more by faith and not by sight and just like jesus said in john twenty twenty nine, it says jesus saith unto him thomas because thou hast seen me thou hast believed blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed and that's us we've not seen him but we believe we believe the words in the book in Genesis chapter 4, what we're going to see now is Cain and Abel. And Adam and Eve have their two boys, Cain and Abel. Eve believes she has gotten a man from the Lord when she sees Cain, but actually Abel is the one who's going to carry the promised seed. Remember now that the Lord told the serpent back there in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman was going to bruise his head. So this, this main attack now, the devil's main attack is going to be on that seed. When he sees somebody that has to do with that seed, he's going to try to kill it. He's going to attack. So Genesis 4 and verse 3. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. You see, Cain brings an offering before Abel does. Cain's more religious. But being religious doesn't mean you're right with God either. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. You see, Cain brought the wrong kind of offering. He brought fruit of the ground. Abel brought a bloody animal sacrifice. Now Cain's offering... Picture someone trying to get God's favor through their own good fruits. Just like Adam and Eve sawing them fig leaves together, that's a picture of self-righteousness, trying to cover up your own badness with your own goodness. Cain's offering pictures someone trying to get God's favor through their own good fruits. Abel's offering pictures getting God's favor through the blood of the Lamb of God. He brought of the firstlings of his flock. He shed the blood of an animal. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a Lamb of God. He's the 
the Lamb, which taketh away the sin of the whole world. Now the murder of Abel was simply Satan's first attack on the seed. Some say that possibly uh, Cain himself was the first uh, attack, but that was that's a whole other story. But the Cain murdering Abel is the first clear attack that we see on the seed. Just as the mixing of the sons of God and daughters of men will be another attack on the promised seed, as we'll see in Genesis 6. If he could corrupt the gene pool, then he would make this, sure the seed would never be born. Now the question comes up, how was Adam and Eve saved? And I remember asking myself that question when I first got saved, and I'd ask other men that question when I was a new Christian. I couldn't... I just couldn't understand how the Adam and Eve got saved before Jesus Christ even died on the cross yet. And the answer given to me 100% of the time was that they just looked forward to the cross. And I remember asking my Sunday school teacher that. My Sunday school teacher at that time, when I first got saved, was actually a woman. So, and she told me, that they were looking forward to the cross. And I, me not knowing nothing, I just said, yeah, that, that sounds good, that sounds right. And I'd ask, uh, the, I'd ask other people that question. They said the same thing, they were just looking forward to the cross. And that sounds like a good answer to go with. But if, they were, if Adam and Eve were saved in the sense that me and you are saved, just saved eternally forever, had it settled and fixed, what would be the point of those bloody animal sacrifices? That's the thing. Later, because later on, I, I asked myself when I was reading the Bible, I'm like, if they were looking forward to the cross and they had the blood of Jesus applied to them, just like the blood of Jesus is applied to me, then why did they still have to offer the bloody animal sacrifices? That's the question I kept that kept coming up to me, and I just couldn't take that they were looking forward to the cross as the answer. But the answer is actually very simple. They certainly were not saved with all the benefits that me and you have today. They did what they knew to be right. And they had faith in the bloody animal sacrifice. And God accepted them on that basis. And Cain himself had an equal opportunity to do the same thing as Abel. Abel, he brought also the firstling of his flock, it says in Genesis 4. He had that opportunity. But he didn't. He brought the wrong type of offering. But this offering here in Genesis 4 that, that uh, Abel brought, the offering made man temporarily, notice I emphasize that temporarily, made man accepted with God. If they died, when Abel died, he didn't go to the third heaven where God is. He went to the heart of the earth where he would be until Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would shed his blood on the cross and pay their sin debt. And if you say that Abel had everything in regards to salvation that we have today, then that's to say that Abel was saved by the blood of Jesus back then, and you're applying the blood of Jesus Christ to him back then before Jesus' blood had even been shed. And now that does just doesn't make much sense to me. Now obviously God knew that he's going to manifest himself in the flesh and die on the cross for our sins. But, is he going to apply the blood of the Lord Jesus to somebody before the blood had actually been shed? And if he did do that, what was the point of the bloody animal sacrifice? Wouldn't the shed blood of Jesus that, would, that was yet to be shed, that God went ahead and applied to them back then, wouldn't that have covered their sin? and therefore no need for a bunny animal sacrifice. So that's the problem you run into, and I just can't look around that. So what I'm seeing is, you can't really even say that they were saved, and if you do say that they were saved, you can't say that they were saved with all the benefits that me and you have today with our salvation. I think at best they were safe. Abel had a blood sacrifice that kept him safe. The Old Testament saints had the bloody sacrifices that kept them safe temporarily. 
And they would, when they died, they would go to the heart of the earth until Jesus Christ came down as the perfect, ultimate, once and for all sacrifice. Then Abel would have went up with the Lord at the resurrection to the third heaven. So Abel and the Old Testament saints were all saved by the blood of Jesus. But it wasn't until the blood had actually been shed and Jesus' work on the cross was complete and they would have went up at the resurrection. So you've got so much arguing back and forth with that. You know, they're saying that everybody was saved the same way and there's just so much arguments back and forth among different groups and camps of Christians everywhere. But really, it's just as simple as that. It's not that they were saved. And if they were saved, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't saved just like me and you with all those same benefits. They went to the heart of the earth, not in hell, where the rich man Lazarus was. But if you read in Luke 16, you got the rich, rich man over here and you got Lazarus over here. They would have went to the part where Lazarus was not to the part where the rich man was. See, the rich man was over on the torment side. And he, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. You know the story in Luke 16. But over here you had Lazarus. And like a comfort side. Over here where Abraham was. And obviously there was water over there. And there wasn't water on the other side. I mean, that story is not a parable. It's not just some story that Jesus made up. That was a real thing. You had the rich man over here on a torment side, Lazarus over here on something like a comfort side. And it seems to me that you had Old Testament saints on one side and a comfort side, lost people in hell on the other side, and a great gulf fixed in between. Now, that's what makes me believe wholeheartedly that they went to the heart of the earth. Now, today, <clears throat> paradise is obviously moved up to the third heaven because Paul said that he was caught up to the third heaven into paradise. And so that's where we go today when we die. But in the Old Testament, it was not so because the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't died yet. But that's a pretty big, pretty big topic and I did a lesson on that a, f a few months back. I think it was called Dispensational Salvations, What's All the Fuss About? And I tried to maybe clear up a lot of the fussing from, you know, you got people who believe so much different about it. You got, like, the Ruckman guys believe a certain way about it. The Knox guys believe a certain way about it. The uh, fundamentalist guys believe a certain way about it. The Anderson guys got a certain way about it. There's all these certain things that they're fussing about in regards to this stuff, and it's like they're just not, they're not on the, they can't get on the same page. They got a complete misunderstanding of what each other believes. But if you really look at it, it's not that the Old Testament saints were saved eternally saved like me and you by faith plus works is that they were kept safe they did they did the work that god required the specific one of them to do and when they failed or or sinned they offered the prescribed sacrifice under the law if they broke the law they offered the pr prescribed sacrifice for when they broke the law and if they did that, it kept them temporarily safe, it got them to paradise when they died in the heart of the earth. And then when Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, he applied the blood to them and they were resurrected. So everybody in the Old Testament was saved by the blood of Jesus, just like me and you, but it wasn't until his blood was actually shed. So that's the best way that I can understand it.